Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 8J, where we're going to use the family tree drawings called pedigrees to investigate family inheritance. We'll talk about why these drawings are so useful, and then we'll use them to solve at first some simple genetics problems, and then some more complicated problems in the next lecture. So, a pedigree drawing shows a kind of family tree, as I said, but it has relevant genetic and phenotypic information added. This is an example of a family tree drawing here, a pedigree drawing. They're useful for summarizing large amounts of information about relationships and about the phenotypes of the people in these relationships. And this information allows genetic processes to be evaluated much more easily than if the problem was simply presented in a paragraph of words. They're most useful for what's called simple Mendelian inherit inheritance, for genes that, have auto that are autosomal or sex-linked, that have clearly dominant or recessive alleles. Um, for more complex um, genetic processes, um, phenotypes that are affected by multiple genes or by interaction with genes, they're a lot less helpful. They're also not useful for crosses with large numbers of progeny. For those, it's easier to just think about frequencies. Um, in, in this course, you should assume that there aren't any errors in the pedigrees, either in assigning phenotypes or in assigning parentage. Both these kinds of errors are relatively common in real um, genetic history pe pedigrees because of lacking information. But here, assume that we've got our information correct. So you don't need to know very much at all to draw simple pedigrees. The basic um, components are symbols representing male and female, um, either unfilled symbols if the individual is not affected by whatever phenotypic trait the pedigree is investigating, or usually black or otherwise shaded if the individual is affected. Diamonds are used where the sex of an individual isn't known. Um, relationships are shown by simple patterns of lines. So two people connected by a horizontal line represents a mating or a marriage. And then the line coming down from that represents their offspring. If they have just one offspring, the line can simply come down to that person. If there are more than one offspring, there's usually a horizontal line connecting all of the siblings. So these three individuals are siblings. They're the children of this marriage. A couple of other symbols you'll encounter are um, a dashed line through a symbol indicating that that person is deceased, and various symbols indicating special degrees of relationship. These symbols can then be put together to make more and more complicated pedigree drawings, depending on the kind of information that's available. So here we have a three-generation pedigree with the grandparents, two couples that are their children and their spouses, and then the children of those relationships. And here we have a more complicated drawing with four generations of people, again with dashed li lines through them indicating that they're deceased, and stars indicating people that are singled out as being of particular interest for some reason in the pedigree. Now, here's a relatively simple genetics problem, and I'm not going to solve it right now, but I'm going to draw it as to let you see how a wordy problem can be translated into a diagram that summarizes all of the information. So in this problem, we're talking, we're mainly concerned with a man named Mohammed and his fiancée, they're not actually married yet, Fatima. And we're told that Mohammed's father died of cystic fibrosis, but his mother and sisters are healthy. So we we'll draw, there's Mohammed, and there's his sister. Here's his parents, there's his mother, and there's 
his father. His father died of cystic fibrosis. We can even draw a line through to indicate that he's dead. Fatima is healthy, but her sister has cystic fibrosis. So we'll draw her parents to, there's her father and her mother. So now we've summarized all of this paragraph. What, the, what it's asking us to find is the probability that their child, whose gender we don't know, will be affected by cystic fibrosis. So this diagram summarizes all the information that we're given. It also provides a structure on which we can annotate our reasoning about the relationships. Now, the next slide takes us through several examples of what kinds of conclusions we can draw from relationships. So here's a very simple pedigree showing two parents and one child. We're interested in gene, we're calling it just gene one. And can you tell from this drawing whether the allele causing the genetic defect is dominant or recessive to the normal allele? And the answer is yes, you can, because this must be a recessive allele because the child has the phenotype, but neither parent has it. If it was a dominant allele, say it was you know, big D caused the phenotype, then the parent carrying the allele would have to be affected. But the parents aren't affected. This pattern can only arise if it's a recessive allele where both parents are heterozygous. So they've got big D, little d, big D, little d, and the affected child has little d, little d. They must have gotten an affected, a defective allele from both parents, even though their parents had normal phenotypes. So gene one must be recessive. Here's another one, gene two. Can you tell here, is this allele causing the defect dominant or recessive? Well, now the mother is, a, is showing the phenotype. Does this mean that the allele causing the phenotype is necessarily dominant? No, it doesn't. In this one, we can't tell. It could be dominant, as I illustrated here, or it could be that she is also homozygous. So it could be that she's got the big D allele, which causes the defect, and so does the child. Or it could be that she is homozygous. The father is heterozygous. In this case, it would be a recessive allele. Here's a third one. Same thing, except now the father is carrying it. And again, we can't tell. What about this one? Both parents have the phenotype, but the child doesn't. In this case, it must be that the allele causing the phenotype is dominant because the parents must be carrying normal alleles because the child has a normal phenotype. So in this example, the recessive allele gives the normal phenotype. The dominant allele gives the abnormal phenotype. So the two diagnostic patterns are two normal parents producing an affected child. That's a sign of that the defect is caused by a recessive allele. Two affected parents having a normal child, that's a sign that the defect is caused by a dominant allele. Now, here's a similar kind of problem, but now you have to think about sex linkage. 
Which of these genetic defects could be X-linked? And the answer is any of them could be X-linked. Uh, this simple a drawing is not going to be diagnostic for an X-linked defect. For example, for pedigree 5, gene 5, the mother could be heterozygous, X, big A, X, little a, for a recessive allele on the X chromosome causing the defect. The son would be X, A, Y. Here, the mother could be homozygous, X, little a, X, little a, for an X-linked allele. Or she could be heterozygous for a dominant allele causing the phenotype, and the son inherited the dominant allele. Here, again, the fact that the father is affected doesn't prove anything because the son did not get the father's chromosome. The son could have gotten his affected chromosome from his mother. But in all of these, these defects could also be autosomal. This is exactly the same drawing we drew in the previous slide, thinking about autosomal defects. Um, in fact, all of these were on the previous slide as illustrations of autosomal defects. So concluding that a genetic defect is caused by an X-linked gene requires more information than you can get from a pedigree drawing that's this simple. So we've introduced um, how to draw a pedigree. We've diagrammed a genetics problem using a pedigree. We've considered signatures of dominant and recessive defects if both parents are unaffected, but the child is affected, the defect must be caused by a recessive allele. If both parents have the defect, but the child doesn't, it must be caused by a dominant allele. Other situations are ambiguous. And we've considered whether patterns could be consistent with sex linkage and found that many patterns are consistent with sex linkage, but they're not diagnostic of sex linkage. Coming up next, we're going to work through some more complicated situations using pedigrees, predicting genotypes and probabilities of particular genetic outcomes. I hope to see you there.